Hi everyone, my name is Aryan Gobadi, and I'm going to be talking to you about data interpretation and presentation. First, we're going to talk about the role of these skills in our day-to-day -day life. Second, I'm going to talk about how to present some data that you have. And finally, we're going to talk about the interpretation of data using statistical tools. It was only when I was preparing this video that I realized how much data and statistics is thrown at us in our day-to-day -day life compared to maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Most notably in our day-to-day -day life, every time we turn on the news, we're bombarded with statistics. Whether it's to talk about the economical situation of the country, to talk about the mortality rates, to talk about the number of accidents on a certain road, everything the news wants to persuade these days, they use some statistics. Another good example is in businesses these days. Let's give a simple example. If a business wants to understand more about what its consumers like about its product, it would do a small survey, and then they would present that survey at a board meeting and try to interpret what they can understand about the consumer's needs. Another great example is modern medicine. If you produce a drug for a particular disease, it's not gonna act the same on everyone. What you do is you take a large test population and see how the drug acts on each person. Once you have this data from your test subjects, you can talk about the average efficiency of your drug and how it's going to act when you release it to the population. But in all the examples that I gave, you're always collecting a large data set. You're not asking 10 people what they think. You're asking 100 people, 1,000 people, several thousands of people. So if you're at a board meeting and you want to understand what your consumer said about your product, you can't go through all the thousands of responses that you got. So you need to have a good way of presenting your data. With the correct presentation of data and the correct use of statistical tools, you can show your audience what the data really boiled down to. And your audience needs to have the correct interpretation of these tools. If you're the chairman of the company and someone presents you with the standard deviation of your data that they're presenting, if you don't understand what a standard deviation is, then you're not understanding the correct interpretation of this data. More importantly, both sides, both the side that's presenting this data and both the side that's viewing their interpretation need to understand the limitations of these statistical tools. So let's put some of the stuff I'm saying into practice. I want to use a really simple example of the cups of coffee that people have in my house to talk about what some of the A-level tools you learn about statistics and data interpretation can really be used for and how you should view them as. So I have a small table of me, my mother, my father, my sister, and my brother, each having a certain number of coffee cups and this has been recorded in a week. What's the first thing that I can calculate from this data? I can calculate the average. How do we calculate the average? Well, we sum up all the numbers of coffee, so 15 cups plus seven cups plus 23 cups plus nine plus zero, and we divide it by the number of data entries that I had. So we're five people in the house, so it would be divided by five. And I get that on average, we drink 10.8 coffee cups. But what does the average really tell me? So it means if everyone was having the same number of coffee cups, they would be having 10.8. It does not, however, tell me that anyone is actually having that many coffee cups. 15, 7, 23, 9. There's no number that's close to 11, actually. So I need some extra tools to interpret this better. So first, I'm going to forget who's drinking what and I'm going to order my numbers. So it's going to be 0, 7, 9, 15, 23, from lowest number of coffee had to the highest. Another simple thing that I can record is the median. What is the median? It's the value of your middle entry. So I have five entries, so the third one would be the middle one. So my median is going to be 9. So just from the fact that I have five entries, an average of 10.8 and a median of 9, I can already interpret something 
about my data without actually knowing any of the data points. We can see that the average is actually bigger than the median. What does that mean? The median is happening in the middle, so at the third person, the third entry, which means the second and the first entry have to be lower than the median. What that already tells me is that more than a half, three-fifths of my data are actually less than my average. So when I was summing up all the numbers and dividing them by five, three out of five of those numbers were less than the average. So that must mean that the two numbers that are bigger than nine must be much bigger in order to pull the average up and make it 10.8. But this doesn't really tell me how far my data points usually are from the average. For that, we look at the variance and standard deviation. So I'm going to call my average mu, it's 10.8. The variance is the sum of the differences, so the xi's are my entries, I sum up all the differences of my data with my average mu, and I square all these differences and then I divide them by the number of entries I have. So in our example, it's going to be the difference of 0 and 10.8, the difference of 7 and 10.8, each of these differences squared, summed up, which comes up to 300.8, and then I divide 300.8 by 5. So the first thing I want you to notice is that we squared all of these differences. Why did we square them? Well, if I didn't have the square there, three entries are less than my average. So for the first three entries, I would have a negative number. And for the last two entries, I would have positive numbers because they're bigger than the average. And then they would cancel out. You would have some negative entries and some positive entries and they would cancel each other out. But that's not what you really want. What you really want is how different are your entries from the average. So what we do is that we square everything but what you lose in the process is the second point is that the variance is a number that has nothing to do with our values on the table. So 60.16 is much bigger than the number of coffees that we have at my house. So to undo these square numbers, what we do is we take the square root of the variance and we call that the standard deviation. There's also other reasons for this two here that I don't really want to get into. So what the standard deviation is really calculating is we take the average distance you have from the mean that you calculated about your data. I'm gonna go back to the standard deviation in a bit, but let's say my dad walks into the room and asks me what the point of me surveying our coffee cups was. How can I present the data I have to him? I could possibly do it in a histogram. On the horizontal axis, I have the number of coffee cups consumed. And on the vertical axis, I have the number of family members. So zero to seven coffees, there's four people that consumes up to seven coffees. Up to nine coffee cups, there's only three people. Up to two coffee cups, there's only 15 people. And up to 23, there's only one person, namely my father. Remember that in a histogram like this, well, if you take the area in each of these squares and sum them up, that's already going to give you your total. Another way I can present my data is by graphing them like this. So on the horizontal axis, I have my family members, the first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. And on the vertical axis, I have the number of coffee cups they have. There's two things that I can see easier from this presentation. One of them is I can notice that a lot of my data is bunched up in here. And what I can do is I can try to approximate the trend of my data from this presentation. So I assume it's linear and there's a formula which tells you what line approximates your data best. There's two benefits to this. One, the line that best fits this data one, it sort of shows me which data points don't fit, which naturally for me, it would be zero and 23. And the other thing it tells me, if I was gonna approximate and say, hey, if there was a six person in the house, 
which drank more coffee than all of us and followed the same, same trend, how much coffee would they drink? And this is what the line would tell me. But I don't want to delve into approximation too much. What I do want to talk about is how to see the average and the standard deviation in this sort of presentation. If you notice, I've drawn a line where the average is 10.8. And these two points that I have, the distance of each of them and the average is meant to be the standard deviation let's say 7.8. So we can immediately observe that the standard deviation is meant to say how far your data points usually are from the average. And in our case, it's exactly that. Three out of the five data points are exactly in that distance away from our average. But the standard deviation and average don't really tell us anything about these two points. Let's say I've only told you that I have five entries in my data. The average is 10.8, the median is 9, and the standard deviation is 7.76. Well, I can easily produce another data set that satisfies three of these conditions. You can check this at home. 2, 2, 11, 19, 20 has exactly the same average, and the standard deviation is going to come out to 7. Point eight. A simple exercise for you is how to change the 11 to 9, and if you can change this data set a bit to get the same median as well. So there's a lot of data sets that can have the same average, median, and standard deviation. In my data set, I have someone who has zero cups of coffee and someone who has 23 cups of coffee. Whereas here, there's someone who has two and someone who has 20. Where we can see this is really the range of our data. The range is the largest number that you have minus the smallest number. So for us, it would be 23 minus 0, which is 23. For this data set, however, the range would just be 18. So the range really tells you something that you couldn't see before from your average, median, and standard deviation it tells you the difference between the maximum you have in your data set and the minimum. Now, let's say we were given this extra bit of data. We're given what the range is. So we start again. Our average should be 10.8. Our standard deviation is 7.8 almost. From the median, I can already tell that the middle value, so the third one, is going to be exactly 9. So that tells me that two, the first and the second values are going to be lower than 9. And now the range is already telling me something. Although I can't say exactly what the lowest value and the top value are, I know that the lowest value is below 9 probably a little bit below 9, so it's most likely not the same as 9. It's something there. And if it's something there, the maximum can only be 23 above it. So I can definitely say, for example, I'm not going to have my top number is not going to be 9 plus 23, which is 32. So I'm definitely not going to go above 32 in my data set. Having the range is already telling you something, and it's telling you that the whole amount of data you have is a shift of up and down of a range of 23. But we can do a little bit better. Let's say I divide all the data I have into four equal pieces. The first 25%, the second 25%, the third, and the fourth. The basic assumption would be that the average value is happening somewhere in the middle 50%. And potentially, the top 25%, which are going to be your highest value, and the low 25%, which are going to be your lower values, might be outliers. So they might not be perfectly arranged with the middle part. So it would be important to understand the difference of the 75th percent from the 25th percent. So how big is the range of the data in this middle 
that is closer to the average. To do this, first we identify what those points are. What's the 25th percent and what's the 75th percent? So for us, when you have discrete data, like the set of coffees that I have, well, the 25th percent comes from here. It's n over 4, so 5 over 4, but you take the number under it, so it's going to be 2, and the 75th percent is happening at 4. So 2 and 4 are the points which I'm interested in. Now, I look at my data set, and I take the value at 2, that's going to be my Q1, and I take the value at 4, and that's going to be my Q3. And I'm going to take the difference between these values. So for me, it's going to be 15 minus 7, which is 8. This number that we've obtained is called the interquartile range. But what does it tell us? Let's go back to this picture. The standard deviation tells me that most of my numbers should be in a distance of 7.8 from the average. So they should be somewhere in this range. The median also tells me that the middle number is 9. It's somewhere around there. So if I didn't have the interquartile range, I would assume that the second and the fourth one are somewhere here and somewhere here. But because I know that the interquartile range, so the distance between the second one and the fourth one, should be 8, they must lie much closer to each other than the standard deviation is saying. So they can only really be 8 points apart. So the interquartile range is giving us a much better idea about the middle 50%. But again, none of these tools actually tell us what the data set is. They can give us a much better idea of where they could be and what a visual presentation of them should look like. To conclude this video, I want to remind you, the tools that you're learning are some of the fundamental tools and the most basic tools that you can use in statistics. And when you're analyzing thousands of entries, these tools will never give you the actual picture. The reason you study these tools and understand how to calculate these numbers yourself is to give you a better feel for how to interpret them later. Because in most of your life, you'll need to interpret data rather than calculate it. With that, I want to thank you for watching and hope the video was helpful.